Hello, hi everyone, and welcome to another Hasselbad webinar. So today uh, we've got an interview with Jonathan Knowles. He's a UK-based advertising photographer, and we'll be meeting Jonathan in a minute. I'm Mark Whitney, the European Events Manager for Hasselblad. Just to go through um, the agenda, very simple today, really. Uh, just uh, a chat with Jonathan, and basically we're going to look at some of his favourite shoots, uh, hear some stories about behind the shoots, and um, and learn a little bit how he created it. And we're ex expecting it to be about 50 minutes in length, uh, give or take, and hopefully we'll have some time towards the end for some questions. So please feel free to get your questions in throughout the webinar. And we can either drop them in as we're chatting to Jonathan or drop them in at the end. Uh, as always, um, this webinar will be recorded. Uh, so a recording of it will be available on the Hasselbad YouTube channel within a few hours of it ending. And uh, there's lots of other webinars on there as well. So if you've missed any from the past few weeks, you can catch up with them there. And then just to quickly um, tell you about our next webinar, uh, we've got a interview with Clive Arrowsmith on uh, Thursday the 16th of July. So uh, just register through the Hasselbad website if you'd like to join us for that. So Jonathan, good afternoon. Good afternoon and hello to everybody who's watching. Yeah, um, I know you've been a, a fan of our previous webinars and uh, you've, you've been watching quite a few of them and wanted to, to have one yourself. So that's, that's really good. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we've got some uh, details there, your website and your Instagram, and obviously people can uh, see more of your work um, if they like what they see later in this uh, presentation. Um, so just a little bit of a biography on Jonathan, just um, very brief before we get on to uh, all the images. Uh, did you want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of your career and uh, what you're up to? Yeah, I mean, I've now been a photographer for just over 30 years, um, primarily working in the advertising sector. Um, and I guess I'm best known for specialising in sort of liquidy special effects work. Um, but I also really enjoy doing uh, beauty and portraiture as well. So, um, yeah, the, the the general kind of uh, the general breadth of opportunities thrown up by advertising photography are something I really enjoy um, and now I'm doing quite a bit more filming as well so um, so that you know again new challenges all the time and always learning always great to keep going yeah and the images on there like you mentioned you do a lot with liquids um, I think especially for the UK audience uh, this shot is used by O2 I believe the mobile phone network um, uh, unfortunately, yeah, so, not yeah. shot on a Hasselblad, but um, before you, you before you owned your Hasselblad, but um, yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a yeah five 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 by four um, film camera plate camera stuff. Yes, I mean, in, it was quite a long time ago. Now we created ten core images for the O2 brand before it launched in two thousand and two. So yeah, a fair while ago, and they're still using them on on most of their stuff. So. Okay, so let's um, talk a bit about when you got into photography as well. So I, I read that you was eight years old when you were awestruck by an image on your school science laboratory wall, uh, which is this one here. Uh, so this got you into photography, would you say? Um, well, I wouldn't say it necessarily got me into photography, but I was completely awestruck, as you say, by that image and this sort of the unseen, uh, the unseen forms of nature that were captured by Harold Edgerton with his very fast flashes in the, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, it, it did inspire me and I carried that inspiration with me for the next few years until I got my first camera when I was 16. So, um, yeah. And the images on my first roll of film were me trying to emulate this particular shot. Uh, there you go, there they are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sunshine in the garden, there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, frame 16 and 17 from my first roll of 20 black and white exposures. Okay, and then you started having to play around with some other bits. Yeah, this was um, about a year later. I'd managed to kind of get myself a summer job working for a photographer called Alan Randall. Um, this was just in, in the school holidays. And whilst I was there, I, I started playing with things and this was um this was one of the shots that I did whilst I was uh, working there in the, in that summer 
um, when I was 17 and here is a Polaroid on the right hand side of the basic setup that I'd done as a test on a Hasselblad funnily enough yeah yeah great okay so um, just to mention quickly before we look at the images so you're the proud owner of an H6100C at the moment that's your tool of choice um, is there any particular reasons why you use this system or um, well, when I first went digital in 2006, I tested all the various systems and the one that I really found was the most usable and uh, easy to handle and the most integrated at the time was the Hasselblad H, uh, as it was then in the H2D, 39 megapixel camera and then it became mm -hmm. the, the day I received my first H2D, it, they uh, it, the launched the H3D and they kindly did upgrade me to that one because I bought it on that particular day. Um, yeah. And ever since then, I've just upgraded through uh, as the new bodies have come out. So I had the H460, I didn't have an H5. And then when the 100 came out, I got that, that this one. Um, it's been a great, great camera. Chips are, are really got a great dynamic range. And, you know, obviously as the files are so large, you can crop in quite a lot when you need to. And uh, yeah, the data that comes off it is fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Okay, that's great to hear. So let's get on to look at your images. And uh, so we've got this one here, this uh, Nespresso um, advert, was it, I guess? Uh, yes, it was, a, it was a, a campaign. It was actually, interestingly, it was, it was one of the first shots uh, that we ever did on the H6D. So, um, yeah, so that was a, just a purely coincidental thing. Um, yeah, this was a campaign where they, and Nespresso had a, a series of pods that were made from what they called vintage coffee. So they were um, coffee that had been stored in a warehouse on the top of a mountaintop for some time, uh, some from 2011. This was in 2016, 17. So um, some of it was from 2014 and some of it was from 2011. So that they wanted to have this kind of wine style imagery, this old warehouse imagery, um, and also introduce the concept of time. So uh, they came up with this campaign, the ad agency Joe Walter Thompson came up with this campaign and asked us to shoot it for them. Okay, and you've kindly uh, sort of um, given us some of the sort of behind the scenes material on this particular shot as, shot as well. So. So what we're seeing on the left-hand side there, is that a visual that's, from the ad agency or? Yeah, that's a, that's a visual that's been drawn by the ad agency demonstrating the concept to get client approval on the basic idea. Um, okay. So it has all the same elements in it. Um, and then we kind of took it on a phase for the execution. Um, but that, that was the basic thing that we, where we started. Then it, they were very keen to use this Rydell tasting glass for the coffee um, again you know taking it into that wine territory but it is a glass that's designed specifically to enhance the flavors of the coffee and that glass and and, and like, as any espresso shot glass would be was actually particularly small so we had to work out exactly how we were going to build this set and make it all work in proportion to the wine to to the coffee glass so on the Left hand side is a kind of quick um, visualization done by my set designer. And on the right hand side is um, a CG kind of thing where we're working out camera angles um, and how big we should make the clock in the background and how big we should make the sacks on the left, um, all in proportion to the two unchangeable things, which were the, obviously the coffee pod and the glass itself. Okay, and then you did some uh, testing with the the coffee, the effect of the coffee as well. Yeah, I mean this this is obviously with any coffee client, it's always going to be a great amount of debate of exactly how they want their coffee to look and how the settle of the espresso should look. Um, so this these were just two of the initial tests that we'd done. I mean the actual thing that you may have noticed, or if you ever come back to it, may you know the, the actual coffee that we ended up with was slightly different underneath. It was a bit more wispy than this. This was, this was deemed to be too early a phase in the settle. So um, this is actually what happens when an espresso settles a bit like a, it looks a bit like a pint of Guinness settling also. But it's uh, um, this was so we moved it on from here. But these were some of the initial tests that we did. And what sort of time period would this normally be over? Like from 
being first told about the project and then the time you, you, um, you sort of been working on it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, it, these days, these things do stretch out over quite a long time. So, I mean, I guess from first hearing about the project to being awarded the project, you know, there'll be time, I'll be doing a, a, a pitch document and a treatment proposal, um, bids that have to go off to cost control. And then once you're awarded the project, then we probably go into pre-production for probably the best part of on this, maybe nearly a month because we had to design and build a set and do various test testing procedures. Um, and then obviously tie, tie it in with the availability of the client and uh, and the agency to attend the shoot. So, um, oh, here's a couple of other bits. So, you know, as a leaflet, it appeared on. That's how it appeared as an Instagram post, as well as the big advertising posters, as well as it that uh, that it was useful. Okay, I think that's, that's, that's a great uh, first start, and um, and then we move on to this image for the English National Opera. Yeah, this was uh, you know I was really excited when I got this, largely because uh, you know um, it was a, I knew we were going to be able to make a beautiful image out of it, and also I I do love opera and particularly Verdi operas, so this was you know a real great opportunity for us. Um, here here we're seeing uh, uh, Aida, the heroine of the piece, who is in a dungeon that's about to be blocked up um, and sealed. So you know, this is the last shaft of light that she will ever see. So we were trying to capture that deep emotion and tragedy of the piece, but also sort of glorify it um, in the way that it should be and make it appealing to try and get uh, people to go and see this thing at the, at the English National Opera. Okay, and this is and how there, it was executed. That, that was how it actually, yeah, actually ran. So, you know, we built, we actually shot all this in, in my own studio and then built various other bits to create the light effect. And interestingly, the concrete pillars on the right um, in this very, uh, I mean, what I missed out was that this, this shot was all about to, hoping to replicate some of the staging, um, which was a very modern staging. Um, that the English Na National Opera had done for this particular thing. And the concrete pillars on the right were in the original visual. And, and I kind of was thinking, oh, how are we going to actually create those in the studio and wondering about that. But then I went to for a meeting with the design company and they're, they're just by Rotherhithe tube station. And on the way back through, there were concrete pillars in Rotherhithe tube station. So I quickly shot those. And, and those were actually, because they're in subdued light, those are what we actually managed to use um, shots that I was that I took wandering through the tube station um, and dropped those in but it, you know it's a great uh, it was a great um, project to work on and then we actually also made a 30 second uh, cinema commercial that went with it okay so with the the layout that's there do you, do you already know what sort of text wants to go on the image and you know to leave negative uh, space for it to go on or is that something that happens afterwards well, yeah, I mean, we had certain, yeah, we were generally in most projects, you'd get a, a layout, a, a set of layouts from the ad agency, knowing where things are going to go in various, you know, when you've got so many different formats in the modern world, um, you have to have cert, a, an idea where text and things is going to go, um, text, logos, little bits of body copy and whatever will uh that's always a requirement. So we, we generally know where that negative space needs to be or, or at least clear space to, to put the information to re make it clearly readable. Okay, fantastic. So the next one we're looking at is an album cover for Black Sabbath. Yeah. And uh, I think you said to me the other day that not many people believe this is shot in camera. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think a lot of people thought we'd CGI'd most of it, or certainly CGI'd the fire, but um, fire itself is something that, you know, always looks strange if it's CGI'd, I think. I mean, it's it's got this sort of, obviously, the luminescent energy of the fire is, is what we were aiming to capture here, so... Um, to, so our main task was really to make uh, avoid that burning out and becoming too white. So um, so we have, you know we are, again did lots of experiments and ma made sure that I knew exactly what the exposure was uh, for when we got to the location. And then you know obviously in these 
outdoor things. Those of you who shoot outdoors know that you've got a magical window of about 10 minutes before and 10 minutes after sunset. So uh, you've got to you've got to hit it in one, really. Yeah. Well, um, we've actually got a video of this, um, which we're hoping will work. Um, so excuse us if it doesn't. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to talk over the top of this to you can say sort of what's going on. But, um, yeah, here we are. Yeah, there are the uh, big letters arriving on set. Um, we're just getting a little bit of a lineup. We moved them around a fair bit in the beginning just to try and get them to the place that we wanted. Um, here we are setting up lights with orange gel on them because we knew that you know we wanted the glow to be coming from the fire. But obviously, if you um, if you light the ground with the fire orange it's not going to it's going to blow out the actual fire itself so you know you'll, that'll go totally white so um so we, we knew we had to light in quite a lot of that orange underneath the sculpture itself um there we are um doing a little bit of a test burn before um before the actual magic moment um that was a bit subtle um that one and here we are uh, this was one that we did we had three sets of letters in total and we had a bit of fun with that last one late at night so and there we are uh, there's ozzy thanking me for my contribution to the project um and there's sharon on the right and that was at the launch party in new york that they kindly invited me to um so uh yeah that was a an interesting evening where with so the rest of the band so I guess for a shoot like that, you'd have a lot of uh, health and safety sort of risk assessments to fill in and things like that, do you, for your shoots? Uh, yes, I mean, that was largely handled by a really efficient producer in the design company who managed all that side for us. Um, mm -hmm. And we also had a very, very good um, specialist, pyro specialist, who had worked on lots of the Harry Potter films and things like that. So that side of it, fortunately, was something that I didn't generally have to worry about. But um, yeah. but that it was done. Yes, it was done. Uh, just to read you. <laughs> okay um just to squeeze a question in actually um from a question from sanford uh what process software do you use do you use the hasselbad focus or is it mostly photoshop that you edit your images in um well i mean i i have to be honest i give most of my work to a, a very experienced retoucher so um, I'll generally send him either the focus files, so he's got focus, so I'll either send the focus files or I'll process them out as DNGs and send them to him. Um, so that's that's the way we generally operate. But yeah, so we can, we we do sometimes use focus to process out, but um, a lot of the time we'll be using DNGs. Okay, and um, we've got a question from Alan on the Black Sabbath cover. How did you prevent setting the entire field ablaze? Did you have any precautions for that or? Um, well, we had some extinguishers and things, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was the middle of winter, the ground was very, very damp. So, uh, so it was, uh, you know, that, that was um, something that we didn't have to overly worry about. And the, uh, the farmer was a great friend of the, uh, of the creative director. So uh, again, I think he was going to be a bit more forgiving. Yeah, if it, if it had been drying in the middle of the summer, I think we might have had to be a bit more careful, but as it was yeah. the middle of a winter winter okay it was late february i think when we shot that so and so it was very very cold um it might have looked like a nice day but it it was cold okay so moving on to a dior uh, campaign yeah this was a shoot we did for dior and it ran in luxure magazine um this was a new sort of set a, a series uh, a new makeup range that Dior brought out that had very, very precise colors and pencils and um, a, re a great makeup artist, Jamie Coombs, who's a Dior ambassador. He came along and did did these very precise designs on the eyes. I mean, there, there has obviously been some small amount of cleanup in retouch, but the actual precision on the actual skin was incredible. Um, you know, so I mean, much, much less than you might have imagined has been done to them in post-production. Um, so yeah this was uh, um and a great little uh, series of images that um demonstrated what can be done with this makeup and how big were these printed were these uh... um well initially they they were in, in uh, a4 in magazines but i mean they subsequently they've been printed 
left um, when they won the, they, they were part of my portfolio that won the Advertising Photographer of the Year Award in New York, and then they were printed three feet tall. Um, so yeah, I mean, though they were crops in on the Hasselblad files, I mean, it just shows how robust the files are. I mean, they, they went up to three feet tall without any problem and people were, people who really know what they're looking at and know what they're talking about were looking at them very, very closely. And I mean, yeah, they, they were really very robust. Okay. Right, and then this is the image we've been using to, to advertise the webinar. Uh, yeah. So yeah, tell us a little bit about this one. This was a campaign for Dole frozen fruit. So this was a this is a product that you might buy to keep in your freezer and then whack in your smoothie or whatever when you put it in the Nutribullet. Um, and uh, so they wanted this explosive flavor. And so they decided that we should blow up the fruit. So, I mean, the, that's exactly what we did. I mean, this pineapple is, pretty much one shot, um, but we filled it with three high explosive charges. And well, I didn't do that. I have a, a, a special effects guy who does it for me. Um, and we blew it up. So the trick with these kind of things is that you actually want them to be blowing apart, but not to be so blown apart that they don't look like what they are anymore. Um, uh, the trick is really just to get the timing right. Um, well, as as well as lighting it, uh, how you want to light it, obviously, but you know you need to get the timing right because a, a high explosive will have an initial flash that you obviously don't want to get in your in your image. And so yeah. you you need the camera to open after that initial flash, but before the thing has moved apart um, too much to uh, to leave it as a recognisable pineapple anymore. So uh, so we've got some fairly sophisticated timing. Uh, systems that I use with my special effects crew and you know we we can adjust those timings down to literally down to a millionth of a second wow so um just you know just to make sure but that that thing is that when you see that that pineapple there that that's currently blowing apart at 4800 meters a second so mm. you know you've got to uh got to get mm. it at the right time and, and how many pineapple how, how many pineapples were harmed in the making of the shot? <laughs> um, on that particular day, probably about thirty. And you know, for quite a long time afterwards, we were finding bits of it. I mean, we do when we do these things, we do line out the studio with lots of plastic and whatever. But we were finding bits stuck to bits of you know ceiling or you know places that you might never have thought they could have escaped to, but they uh, they did. Yeah. Um, Okay, and then you've also got one for a strawberry as well. Yeah, again, that was uh, that was the, the same shoot, but it, that uh, strawberry only needed one high explosive charge within it because it would blow apart with that. I um, mean, the pineapple was one shot entirely. This we did cheat a bit with this one and stick the toe of the strawberry, the tip of the strawberry, back on from another shot because um, the perfect explosion shot on this on the strawberry you know the actual base that defined the shape had, had disappeared so uh, um, that had already gone out at 4800 meters a second from the bottom so uh, so we stuck we stuck something else back on just to help that along but they are done for real yeah i mean they're not they're not comped together or cg'd they're, i mean it's all done in camera Okay, and uh, a question from Kahit. So, so what uh, flash do you use? It obviously has to be quite a, a high speed, fast flash duration, I guess. Yeah, I mean, most of my stuff is done with bronze color flashes. These in particular were done with a, a thing called a high speed flash that is made by a kind of garage inventor guy who sadly doesn't make them anymore. But these flashes that are used on this, the flash duration is 111 thousandth of a second. So, I mean, some quite a lot faster than even the Scoro Bron colors. But um, um, I, I think, unfortunately, the guy found that there was just not a big enough market for him to carry on making them. But he does still support the maintenance of mine, which is very kind of him. OK, so we move on to a Glenfiddich campaign. Yeah, this was a campaign that we did. Uh, Glenfiddich produced a series of whiskies called the Experimental Series, and this was Experimental Series Whiskey Number Four, um, which has notes of campfire, smokiness, and toffee sweetness, and so they they called it Firing Cane. Um, 
Now, the concept from the advertising agency on this was that they wanted to have smoke, but not, they didn't want to do it with real smoke. They wanted it to feel a bit more billowy, uh, um, a billowy uh, look. So we created this using um, colored liquid within water. Um, so that's, that's why it has that nice sort of softer, cloudier feel. And then we also shot lots of crystals of sugar and then comp those into the bits that you see around the sides. So we did shoot this all together, apart, apart from the sugar. The bottle itself was shot as a beautiful pack shot. And then within the liquid, we had a plastic mock-up of the bottle. Um, the logo itself was in in the water uh, with the with the with the plastic mock-up, and then we fired this stuff from the top and sh and filmed and shot it from underneath. All the colours there that you see there are all lit in. Those aren't created in Photoshop or anything at all. We we lit those in um, because we knew exactly what that that's what we wanted to do. Um, so yes, I mean it's really quite a simple comp. So we you know almost literally just comping the um, the bottle, the perfect bottle back into the cloudy effect that we'd shot behind. I mean, we did a, originally envisage that maybe the clouds would come through the lettering a bit more, um, but then it was decided actually that for branding purposes that the, the logo should be left entire on the poster. Um, but in, in the film version that we shot of this, the, the, you know, the, the, the smoke does come through the logo. Okay. So how um, often are you finding that now that clients are asking for sort of both stills and motion? Is motion becoming more of a consideration in the, in the way you... Oh, yeah. Plan to think? Yeah, I mean, there's a, I mean, most projects now have some moving elements in the brief. Mm. Um, whether we shoot those entirely as moving image or sometimes we would, you know, animate the stills or whatever, but there's generally a moving image component in most briefs now, certainly at, in, in the big ad. Uh, campaigns. Okay and we've had uh, quite a few questions asking sort of what lenses you would normally use uh, particularly for the exploding pineapple and strawberry. Um, do you have just like one main lens or two or three that you would switch between? Um, well on the, on the pineapple and strawberry I think um, it's a case of me getting getting a bit further back so I've probably used uh, I think I, I used a 150 on those. I mean, that's a really, really beautiful lens. That that Hasselblad 150. Yeah, really love that lens. Beautiful and sharp. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm using the 100 mil quite a lot as well. Um, and when we need to get a little bit closer, yes, I'll use the 120 macro. Okay, so some more explosive uh, style shots uh, for graph diamonds. Yeah, this was. Um, uh, project that we shot for graffiti magazine that was um, and it also then ran on their on their website and and lots of promotional other promotional material but graffiti magazine is is the was was the graph in-house magazine at the time um, and this was a project that was all about these beautiful vibrantly colored diamonds and emeralds and rubies and wherever you see whichever stone you see in any of these rings um, according to Mr. Graff, is you know, this is the finest example of this particular stone that you will ever find. Um, so we had to go to Graff in Mayfair to shoot the rings themselves because they are so valuable that they couldn't possibly move them out of the building. So I mean, I think they told us that the value of the six rings that we shot that day, the total value was about 400 million pounds. So um, they didn't really want to move those out of the building. No. Uh, so, so we had to go there and I had, you know, and the way that I shoot jewellery, I mean, it, it requires pretty much total blackout. And so I got to the, to the locale, I did go and recce the room that we were going to shoot in before. And it was, uh, um, un unfortunately, had this enormous glass window in it. So, you know, we then ended up having to take enough blackout fabric and whatever to build a, a, a tiny blackout studio on a, a rounded, what's effectively a boardroom table in this in this room within the uh, within the offices there, but um, but you know we managed to get what the shots that we needed to get, so that was brilliant. So okay, um, um, and then we came back. So then the next day, yeah, we obviously didn't shoot the explosive parts in the, in the office in Mayfair. No, that that wouldn't have gone down well, I think. 
So we then came back the next day. Once we knew our setups and what and what we'd actually got, we we shot the explosive clouds in in my own studio the next day. Again, all lined out with plastic, and again, you know, finding um, making uh, making coloured footprints around the place for for weeks afterwards. <laughs> um, question from Manus: um, How do you control your depth of field? Do you sometimes use focus stacking or um yeah i mean it's sometimes we 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 use sometimes we use focus stacking otherwise yeah i mean yeah i'll do focus yeah you know, do, do several focus pulls on a, on a on a piece like that but yes i mean we do have a a thing that moves the camera a little bit each each exposure and it depends really what you're doing if you're if you're focus stacking in a in the purest sense, you need to keep the lighting exactly the same from frame to frame. Otherwise, the focus stacking software gets a bit confused. So if you're doing anything strange, like adding a little bit of light painting or whatever, then um, then the focus stacking software gets confused. So you have to rely on um, a skilled retoucher to put it all together for you. Um, but yes, we do focus stack a lot. Okay, so moving on to a shoot for Guinness. Now this was um, this was a good few years ago. Now this was shot for um, Saatchi and Saatchi from Cape Town, and they ca came over. They wanted to shoot this um, a tornado in a Guinness glass. I mean, there's there's a, a, a to start with there's a problem with a tornado in a Guinness glass in that you can't see into the Guinness glass. So we then had that was one of the first problems we had to work out how you're going to see the tornado, um, and then. Uh, so if I start working from this particular shot, so we we went to the location, we found a location that was fortunately that they fortunate they wanted to come here actually in barley season. So late July was the perfect time. So we found a nice location in Kent, which had um, had ripe barley. I mean, we did actually strangely have a model making team on or on site who who might have been able to spray the barley gold if it hadn't gone quite ripe enough but we were, were lucky enough that there'd been four or five days of really hot sunshine that just before the shoot so it all um it all turned just nicely um so we then shoot we shoot the big field we also create the highlight within the um within the field with some flashlight we also shoot the glass and the bottle in the field so we have a good reference of what any prismatic effects and reflections will be. You may also notice in, in the shot that there's a few strange looking plants around the Guinness bottle and glass and those are sorghum and those are model made sorghum because in Africa most Guinness is made from sorghum rather than barley so they wanted to have reference of that within the shot. So once we've got the background all done, and Owen, oh, we were we were very lucky with the skies also that day. Um, those those skies were all um, shot in the field in Kent, and you know a couple of a couple of them were merged together. But you know we managed to get those. All of that was from from the skies that we shot. So then uh, we come back to the studio and we reshoot the bottle and the glass and the tornado to fit in with what we've actually shot in the field. So. Or always working from the background forwards, really. I mean, that's like that's the key, is so so that everything you know everything fits together because you, you and so your light you've got to know what the light of the background is doing so that you can work out what's happening in the foreground. Mm. Okay, and you use um, outdoor lighting, the sort of portable lighting for this, do you? And uh, yeah, I think that was yeah, that was a, a battery-powered Bron flash we used for that in. Uh, out when we were outside, obviously we used the bronze plugged into the mains when we, once we got back to the studio. So, hmm. okay, and to, to get the moody skies, you would shoot at a, a faster sort of yeah, shutter yeah. speed. Is that like yeah. to build the Just preparing yeah. our exposure, bracketing the exposure down? Yeah, um, you know, uh, and when you're combining, say, with a flash in the in the foreground, you're 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 wanting to darken down the the sky anyway, so. I mean that some of that was uh, a happy accident and some of it was intentional. Hmm. Okay, great, thank you. So a shot for Heineken now. Yeah, this was an interesting little set of pictures that um, the ad agency Geometry and I were asked to 
or geometry or asked by Heineken to produce some generic branding uh, campaign imagery. Um, and so the creative director got in touch with me and we had a couple of days where we played around and experimented with various things, presented some ideas back to the head of design at Heineken and he chose three routes that we then worked on and this was one of them uh, where, I mean, this is a super macro shot. I mean, the area that we're talking about here is probably a piece of glass sprayed with droplets that's maybe, you know, one and a half to two centimeters across or uh, around. Um, the logos are all, uh, they're all really in in the droplets. We haven't retouched any of those in at all. Um, we've, we've, we were doing that just using prismatic effects of the droplets by placing things in behind uh, from where we were shooting. Um, so they all, and so, you know, everything's kind of turning upside down and going the wrong way around and we've got to work with that. But we, we managed to make that work in insufficient droplets in the foreground to so that you actually have a recognizable, you know, the, the green and the red star with the white key line um, and bits of the logo word itself. Um, so there were sort of several shots in this campaign, but um, this was this was the one that I liked the best. And did you know what this particular shot was used for? Was it? Um... Uh, yeah, I mean it was used um, in the bits of point of sale, and uh, uh, mm. there are Heineken shops around the world, and uh, and there were there was another shot in this campaign that was used as a, a which was a sort of swirling beer shot but the, it was very very green still with lots of bubbles and that was used as as their main poster campaign across europe for for um for that year and they even used it on the front cover of the annual report so they obviously quite liked it so that was good <laughs> okay so another coffee shot here yeah, yeah. So this was for M and C Sarchi in London, um, and I was. It was great that they asked me to do this part of the campaign. Initially, I'd shot all of the stills. This was for the launch of the Law capsules. Um, when when Nespresso's patents all started to run out on their machines, um, you can st you you were allowed to. St other companies were allowed to start to make capsules for them, and so Law decided they were going to make some capsules and so we'd shot all the initial uh, still life work and coffee work for for law for that and then because they'd seen that I'd had, had a beauty portfolio as well they asked me to shoot um, this uh, model Maud Bowrek who um, who had been in the TV commercial jumping around from girders to out of windows and whatever in in the TV. Um, so here we shoot with this kind of a background in place, um, shoot the model, various positions, obviously lots of positions over the over the day, you know, much debate has obviously gone on about the styling and the dress and then when we finally choose the final, when we get to choosing the final shot, I then reshoot the coffee um, and work out again, we have a, a long debate about exactly what should be happening within that coffee cup. So, uh, you know, how is that coffee going to look underneath that crema head? Um, and so, and, th and then that's finally put together to deliver the final shot. So, do the do the clients uh, often attend the shoots and uh, provide yeah. their feedback as you shoot? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, on a shoot like this, you definitely have the clients on the shot. I mean, this is a big this for them. This was a big, important shoot, so they would definitely be here. I mean, having said that, in in the last few weeks, we've been shooting with clients and uh, art directors remotely. Um, so you know, we've been providing two feeds out of the studio. So one one a feed from the main cameras, and so be that the main focus viewer in separate window feed um, and then there's another feed with uh, say a DSLR that's filming what you know the entire entirety of what's going on in the studio so they can sort of see what what the setup's looking like in general and that sort of thing um, and then I'm wearing a remote mic and a headset so that uh, so that I can speak to the art director or creative director without needing to be in front of the computer I mean, it's been different I mean I do prefer people being in the room to work together on things like that, but you know, in the circumstances in which we found ourselves, it's worked very well. 
um, and it's been a new and interesting experience. And I, you know, maybe it will work well for shooting for clients outside the UK without me needing to travel in the future. Who knows? But um, it's a system we now know works, so it's good. Okay. And is is a perk of this type of photography that you get lots of free samples or not? Do you do you, you have a uh, studio uh, full of coffee and Heineken and? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. There's generally yeah lots of coffee generally left, and yeah, quite a lot of. It depends, really. I mean, you you get do get through an ex, if you're doing a live beer shoot, is it is extraordinary, you know, how much beer you do get through, um, and so sometimes there isn't that much left. Sometimes we even have to go out and buy more. So right. you didn't get any of the free diamonds, though. Uh, no, sadly not. No, those those <laughs> they are more uh, picky about. Um, you know, and the, yeah, I mean, uh, and when we were in Graf, I mean, they would even even follow you to the bathroom. I mean, they were they were you know, sort of pretty, pretty hardcore there. Yeah. OK, a uh, question from Pamela. Obviously, we don't want you to reveal uh, exactly on this, but um, when you're paid for a shoot, do you just get sort of the one payment for creating the ad or do you also get sort of uh, uh, a payment every time the image is sort of used for different applications? What sort of agreement do you normally have? Um, it dep again, it depends on the agreement that you make with the client. I mean, if you um, Largely, you'd be agreeing a, a certain media usage in a certain territory for a certain amount of time, and if they then want to use it beyond that or outside that, then you'd agree a diff uh, an additional fee. Sometimes clients want to be a bit more flexible, so they will um, they will agree a, a, a larger payment up front so that they don't have to come back and ask anymore. Um, okay. Always, I'll retain the copyright. However, I mean that's. That's yeah. the main thing. I mean, they can have an unlimited usage license for an unlimited amount of time, um, but I'll still own the copyright. Okay, and uh, a question from Jane, um, which is sort of, I guess, mainly related to this image. Do you have a preference for shooting people versus inanimate objects? A bit of both, maybe? Um, I, I, you know, I, I love the variety, really. I mean, and I think, you know, shooting people's always good the challenges are very different from say making um mm. making a, a pint of beer with look appetizing with lots of spritz on the outside of it so i mean it's you know the challenges are different and you know i enjoy that variety um and i'm you know it's, uh, i feel fortunate that i do get that opportunity to to uh, switch things up and a lot of the time the fact that i can do that brings me more. I mean, I've just done a, a campaign for another drinks brand that had some people elements and some some splashing drinksy elements, and you know the fact that I can do both those uh, disciplines has helped me win that work. I think. Okay, so moving on to this, which I understand was a bit of a sort of personal project for you. Well, yeah, again, you know, this is the um, talking about people and drinks. This was a, a project that I came up with. Um, I have a creative consultant lady who I work with, Emma Taylor, who um, we decided, oh, yes, actually, we need a, a few more things where we've got people with drinks. And, you know, uh, I was a great fan of the program Mad Men when it was on. I mean, I think it still is on Netflix, but um, well worth a watch if you want to, to see it. Um, and this was inspired by the opening titles where there's all these silhouetted um, figures flying around um, and but we wanted to shoot people but hero in on the drink so um, so we went for this silhouetted look and but uh, then lit the drinks as as very much as the hero. Mm. What so I particularly they... like about this shot is even though it's a silhouette you can still see the line of the, the cheekbone which I think is a nice touch. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we left certain bits in like that, you know, and the collar is 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 visible, um, yeah. a little bit of the edge of the chair and that sort of thing. Yes, I mean, that was very much a, a, a an intentional thing. Yeah. Uh, again, I mean, the hero is is the drink. So in in all of these, there will be little bits like that that you can see. This you can see a little bit of the detail in the hand there, but it's fundamentally a silhouette. Um, okay. Um, a question from Jeffrey: Do you do you ever shoot animals at all? Have you ever had to shoot animals in your? I world? have shot animals. I mean, I've shot strangely. I've shot quite a lot of fish. I've shot a crocodile, a porcupine, um, a few dogs, cats. Um, 
No, I, I wouldn't say I'm specialised in animals at all. And there are people who, you know, there are people who do animals really, really well. Um, but I mean, generally when I've shot them, they've been part of, say, a drinks campaign or whatever. So they've been something that I've shot as an ancillary thing to to my main areas of speciality. Um, you know, we did once get a dog in who worked out and worked out that if he faced the camera, then the flashes would go and... If he didn't face the camera, the flashes wouldn't go, and it took him seven shots to work that out. And there was no way you'd get him to look at the camera for the rest of the shoot. So, uh, and that was in the days of film. So we were then rushing the film off to the lab to see if we'd got the shot. I mean, fortunately, there was one frame that we could use, and with a bit of retouching help, that could uh, that dug us out of trouble. But you know, we'd have liked we'd have liked a, a, a bit more choice. <laughs> okay. Um, a question from Teresa. Um... Do you work with the same team regularly or do you have different assistants for different shoots? Um, well, I, here we have generally in the studio, we'll have one as, uh, main assistant who's here pretty much most of the time. Um, we bring in you know, additional assistants as, as we need them. Um, and again, people like stylists, hair and makeup artists, you know, I have people who I work with, but you bring in different people for their different specialities. So you know, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, you'll bring in different people, but yeah, there, there is a there is a kind of biggish core team, but it will um, but will will bring in the right people for the right job. Yeah, of course. Um, we've had a few questions about how these particular Mad Men shots were lit. Are you able to tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, the drinks themselves, we we shot well. We shot the models with holding the drinks themselves um largely backlit obviously um because they're bringing out the silhouettes um, and then we uh reshot the drinks and drop them back in so in the we reshoot shoot, shot the drinks in the perfect way and drop them back in okay and um a question from reza about the the drinks as well do, do you struggle sometimes or is it a problem to have to overcome reflection of light on the glass you have to um, in a certain way yeah, I mean, I think you know, you one gets into the habit of seeing, looking at a glass, and seeing, seeing, and knowing where the light is going to hit it, and um, and positioning the lights so that you can still bring the best out of the drink without having a huge reflection in the glass. I mean, I'm not a great fan of these cylindrical reflections in glasses, but you know, lots of people do like that. But I'm, you know, I will tend to shy away from that. Um, you know, sometimes you actually want, you know, you want that to bring out the glassiness of something like a, a bottle or whatever. I mean, then that depends really on the, on the circumstance. But um, yeah, the, the real hard cylindrical, what, you know, lights from something that, you know, in the 80s, they might have called a bottle reflector is um, you know, not something that I really try to try to get. And a lot of the time it does also interfere with branding on the on the product as well. So, you know, I mean, that's. Um, if you've got a really very harsh, strong reflection, so um, that's uh, that. Uh, you know, that's just a personal preference, really. Though. <laughs> okay, so that's the the end of the images, but we have got quite a few questions. So if you don't mind uh, asking a few of those, um, we've got quite a good question from Harles actually. So in your time of working in advertising, has there been any sort of changes that you can comment on? You know, in in sort of how the advertising industry has changed over the years obviously we mentioned um, about motion earlier um, yeah, so, yeah. motion is definitely a, a big thing now um, I mean very much more interaction with the clients from our perspective we used to very much be much more just dealing with the agency and the, the clients rarely came on the shoots now pretty much all the time and on a big shoot you'll have the clients here as well um, we as a as a business have to produce far more documents than we used to have to produce. I mean, it used to be just a felt pen scamp from the art director. We'd give them a quote and they, you know, we'd chat about it a bit and they'd say, right, okay, yeah, yeah, you've got the job or whatever. And now we're going into much more sort of triple bid processes and um, but that's largely driven by the client companies who have a triple bid mandate from for any project that's going to be over a certain amount of money. Um so you know that's does um does put a certain level of of extra work on us um but it does mean that you think about everything 
all the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question from Kahit. Um, do you have a representation by an agent at all? Um, in the UK, I have an in-house agent, um, UK and Ireland, um, a guy who works with us in the building here. Um, in, in Europe and the US, uh, I have a, an agent. Um, so yes, I'm in outside the UK. I'm represented by a, a formal agent in the UK. Um, we manage it from here. Okay. A uh, question from Gabriel. Um, generally speaking, how much effort would you typically make to preserve the original shot and avoid special effects where possible? Uh, well, uh, how, you, how you define special effects. I and mean, if you're doing an explosion, then that's a special effect, isn't it? But you, you're trying to capture the image in one shot in camera. Um, mm. Photoshop effects, yes. I mean, one would tr one tries to get as much as possible in camera, um, mm -hmm. but there are certain times when, yes, in in the modern world, it's sensible to to capture things in 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 in, in individual pieces because you can, and it's also a case now, particularly with you know so many so many s stakeholders, as I think we like to call them, um, you know. Uh, down the line there will be a lot of different opinions about how things should look and whatever and if you haven't built all your bases by capturing things in individual pieces then you might struggle once you get into the retouch process down the line because you need all those bases to to build whatever whatever it's decided you need later okay um and a question from a uh, hardev um how do you um you know do advertising photographers have a, a style and what would you say your style was and how would you recognize your style if you was a, an advertising photographer? Um, well, I think every individual artist of any sort has has their own style, don't they? So um, I guess, I mean, I have a very particular way that I light things and see things and um, that will be different to you know another advertising photographer who sees that who looks at and sees the same things and um so yeah i mean there are lots of people who will come up for the similar jobs that similar jobs to me but um a lot of the time they will be lighting things differently and the art director will then decide who he wants to work he who he or she wants to work with uh, based on um based on that style i guess in the end so yes we do all have our individual style um, how I would describe my style. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, that, that, it's not for me to decide that, is it? I think you can. <laughs> no. Okay, a uh, question from Nigel. Uh, do you do a lot with sort of cooked food? And is there any sort of tips and tricks for working? Uh, uh, I, I'm not really a specialist. I mean, I do do, again, cooked food and when it comes along. Um, not really a specialist in that, but when I do do it, I bring in a really great home economist food stylist and um, leave the food style, definitely leave the food star side to them and the, and uh, ask them to bring in the uh, the perfect cooked dish to to me and I'll then do my own lighting on that and in my own style, obviously. Okay um a question from summit like how, how much uh, do you do other photography away from your normal nine to five job just on a personal level do you do you enjoy taking photographs generally of family and holidays and yeah i mean i um, do come back with uh, from holiday with an unfeasibly large amount of um digital images lots of which sort of never tend to see the light of day i'm afraid i mean they they get loaded into the I photo uh, the photos app on the computer so everybody can look at them but um but that's just generally as a lot of the time as, as as far as they get but um but yeah I do take them definitely take them <laughs> yeah it's the, the typical of the the photographer in the family gets asked to do all of that sort of stuff and uh, yeah even myself in my role I, I get that so I can I, I can understand that okay I think that's uh, pretty much it so thank you very much Jonathan I think it's been great and uh as i say if anyone wants to see more of jonathan's work or uh or drop your line or whatever then you've got your your website and your social media that we mentioned earlier in the webinar um yeah so thank you very much jonathan well thank you that has been great to talk thank you okay thank you
Bye bye. Right. So just to finish off today, um, we've got a uh, webinar feedback questionnaire that uh, will come up after you exit the webinar. If you'd be so kind to to fill that in for us, it's it's really good to to know what you think of the webinars and uh, what we can plan for for the future for you. Uh, another quick reminder that we've got uh, Clive Arrowsmith on Thursday the 16th of July, so hopefully you can join us for that. And another reminder that the recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel within a few hours of now. And of course, for any more information on Hasselblad, please go to hasselblad.com. Um, we've got all our future events and webinars listed on there. Obviously, lots of information about products. Um, our partner network is on there. Um, some inspirational stories, lots on Hasselblad history, for example, the space program and our early days with Victor Hasselblad. Um, and you can request a demo and support. So please give that a try. So thank you very much. Thanks again to Jonathan and hopefully see you again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.